Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Aarons, and we have the fan favorite back. We have Billy Coles. Um, he's gotten back from his his hiatus down in the warmer state of Florida. How was that, by the way? Uh, not as warm as you would hope, my friend. Uh, so we uh, had a couple of bad cold fronts, made the fishing pretty tough. It was like half vacation, half fishing, and it was right after the big bass. Um, so we did the Harris chain. Um, I caught, I think a five pounder in three days of fishing, tons of little dinks and stuff like that. But for me, it was, uh, a big explore mission. So, you know, I talked a little bit before I'm potentially playing with the idea of, of being a guide in Florida for half the year. So I'm feeling out different areas and different bodies of water. Cause to best of my knowledge, they're not all the same in Florida. It looks like the St. John's is very different than the Harris chain. Harris is different than Kissimmee and Okeechobee is kind of its own beast. So we checked out the Harris chain, dude. We, we really, really liked it, but the fishing was definitely, um, that typical Florida, like there's, that's no joke. That's a real thing. Um, straight lock jaw. So, but it was a good time. I mean, dude, I miss, I miss fishing grass. Um, so it was it was fun to fish pads and fish some bed fish and, and stuff like that. But yeah, it definitely was not what I was hoping for with uh with a big Florida trip for fishing. It's gotta be weird though, like going from to Smith Mountain Lake. And for you guys that don't know about Smith Mountain Lake, I think there's probably maybe like two strands of grass in the whole maybe. thing. Maybe. I've pulled one of them out and that's <laughs> yeah. And then you get to go down there and then it, it is a completely different world. And I, I kinda like that idea though, because it, it'll if you ever want to like go to the next level, it's also going to make you a way better angler to have that in your belt. Cause Florida myths a lot of people. I mean, you see it all the time. Florida boys kill it in Florida. They go to Highland reservoirs and stuff like that. And they struggle the rest of the year. Um, so from my experience with Florida, dude, it's, it's small, small areas hold a huge population of fish and you pick it apart, but it's literally like needle in the haystack. Like you need to understand multiple grass types, sediment bottoms different types of like lily pads stuff like that winds huge there like your stuff can get blown out the next day um which i experienced a little bit um and it's just painfully slow sometimes but i think that's what you're saying you know or what i'm kind of getting at with it it's it would make me a way better angler in the form of all aspects of fishing um because i fish really fast here at home um, as same as with on bugs and, and patternable lakes, Florida is more like, okay, you know, basically what they're going to eat. You know, you don't have to pack a bunch of stuff for Florida. It's pretty straightforward plastics and chatter baits and traps and a little bit of top water. Um, but you know, we ran into the day before we got there for the last day of the big bass. I mean, it was blowing like 40 miles an hour. So I already knew the day after we got there, the lake was just going to be a hot mess. Um, and what's interesting in Florida is it's all sediment bottom. So the Harris chain is sand. So when it gets, um, like stirred up, it turns like a, it was like a ginger ale color, um, for a stain, not like a green and not like a brown. You could literally scoop it up and put it in a Tupperware and you could see like the sand getting stirred up. Um, which was, yeah, which was pretty cool to kind of see, but I definitely think it's a high likelihood that we'll end up there. Um, I just don't want to end up going there and just being a shiner guy. So I think it's just going to take me some time to, to narrow it down, to figure it out. That place is fascinating. I had, um, I had Harry Linsenberger on, um, well, I recorded it, but, uh, it dropped today guys, which would be Thursday, whatever, March 2nd. Um, and he actually lives down there. He finished 13th at Toyota down there at the Harris chain and just putting up some images of like, well, okay, what's going on in Okeechobee? And the way he breaks it down about, yeah, well, if the wind blows from the south, it's almost like a tide where that means it's two feet of water being pushed on this side of the lake and stuff. And it's just like I, you can't comprehend that. That's such subtle stuff that will, will will screw an angler that's not from there. If you don't pick up on that immediately on what that's going to do to your places and then how the fish react down there to a cold front, which is so funny because in your home state of Minnesota or Virginia, like the fish don't generally speak go as lock jaws they do down there when no. it gets colder, but no, they, they will shut it. down. Yeah, they yeah. love it. Yeah, so w one thing, the lockjaw thing definitely n knocked me on my ass for sure. Um, but the other thing that I picked up just fishing it is, I so I've checked out Griffin, Dora, the Dora Canal, and Harris. So I think a lot of the tournaments are getting one on Harris and Opopka. Um, 
but what was interesting, and I have learned this throughout my time in Florida, is if it does blow and it blows a certain direction, you know that area of the lake is blown out. You can go to different areas and it's a completely different lake. So the last day when I finally figured that out and started catching better fish was we ran Griffin and ran up to a Lake Yale Canal is what it's called. It's like a little pond off the, off the lake or whatever. But you literally turn the corner and it went from ginger ale color to like seven foot clarity. Like it was like a mud line. Um, and as soon as we went in there, you just started, there was just bass everywhere in there, everywhere in the pads. You could literally just on the main motor, look for beds. Um, and I've ran into that before in Florida where it's like, this looks kind of stained. And then you really find actual clear water and you're like, yeah, I was fishing in mud. It, it is interesting, a grass lake versus I think a pattern lake, like Smith mountain lake where, and and this is at least the way it's been described to me, what I've seen, where if you're fishing a grass place, it's going to be an area. And then that's the area that you're going to go and you have to just stick it out, crowd be damned. Versus if you get on a Smith Mountain Lake or a, a Beaver Lake, something like that, can you just run a pattern through the whole lake? Or is there just areas that just have concentrations? Yeah, generally speaking for patternish lakes. I would say... Uh, I would say, yeah. I mean, mostly that's going to be dependent on the time of year, but I mean, we're talking, it's March 2nd. So we have the BFL coming up, another cat tournament. And, you know, we're talking months and months of tournaments basically happening here. Um, right now for me, it's actually patterning super well. Um, and I know exactly what I'm looking for, what depth range. It's not a huge variety of like baits. Um, so that is, is working really well for me. But certain times of the year, I would definitely say it's spot based um, here. Bugs. I mean, I feel like all of them can kind of do that. Hey, you have to be on a certain stretch to get bites. Um, but right now, you know, we talked last time that Smith was being kind of lame um, is I think that finally kind of turned around. I think we had enough of a warming trend while I was gone in Florida and I started seeing weights definitely start creeping up. And when I got home, I mean, the first night I got home, I went out and just fun fishing for 40 minutes and I had 21 pounds in like an hour. So um, it's changed a lot in the last probably 30 days here. And it seems like to me they're more hungry than the last couple of years because they probably locked jawed for the last couple of months or, or weren't eating as much. Why is that? It is so weird that this this winter was so frustrating for Smith when one of my friends, uh, Matthew McCluskey, uh, he was actually on the show. He caught the state record white crappie and threw the damn thing back. He weighed it and everything. And the thing is massive. And he said they're chewing this winter on Aquaquan. And it's so weird. But Smith didn't like it. Smith didn't like it not being a hard winter. Yeah. So I've been here for four winters now and two with lots of rain and lots of cold are were awesome. And the last two were basically got cold. Bait starts going to the back, gets hot for like 10, 12 days, and then it never turns into fall fishing. And then it's like all of a sudden you just go out one day and it's like, oh, they're all super deep now, I guess. Um, we never had a shad stun. I saw maybe like a wad of 50 seagulls where usually the like the first couple of years when there was shad stuns, it was literally at the bridge, like thousand seagulls um, diving on, on bait fish and stuff. And I just, I never saw that. And then for me on some of the tournaments that I fished before I left for Florida, super deep, 35, 40, 50 treetops, like baits in 70 feet. And you find a lucky long cut that's got bait pushed into the back and you just throw a spoon and a blade on them but it i never got on like a rattle trap chatter bait jerk bait shallow like none of that stuff happened for the second winter in a row and i just the only thing that i can think is it doesn't get cold enough and the water doesn't snap um the water doesn't snap there was one tournament all winter long where it was very cold here and they did have multiple bags over 20. so I, I would think with Smith, it really needs a cold winter for it to to really pop off here. What what are the temperatures? And, and again, you don't have to give away the juice to the degree, but generically, what is the pre-spawn at Smith temperature wise? Example is Lake Anna is always like when the dogwoods bloom at Lake Anna, that's when they're going to generically be on the beds. Um, what are the temperatures are you looking for for each each movement? Yeah, so 
well, currently right now, and Garmin runs cold. So for anybody that has multiple units or doesn't have multiple units, if you have a Garmin, it's usually like two degrees less than a Lowrance. A Hummingbird's kind of right in the middle of that. I think Lowrance is closer to being correct, um, just based on how the fish act. So right now going out in the morning, it's like 47, 47 and a half. And by the end of the day, if we have sun, I'm seeing like 50, 51. Um, Although it's weird, I agree with you, like look at nature, dogwoods. Um, we have a rose bush in our front yard. When we got back from Florida, dude, it's completely bloomed. Um, we have flowers in our front yard. Yeah, too. which that was a week and a half ago. Um, all the dogwoods are going like crazy, but nothing is really going on shallow. Um, and so as much as I love to take nature into account um, with live scope and technology, I mean, you can just kind of see where they're at. And this year, it's not where it was the last couple of years as far as fish being shallow. So that's right now. Um, I think it's going to progress super fast this year. Like in the four days of practice that I've had, I've had to switch baits twice. Um, but I'm following along with kind of how they're going from like, okay, we're real cold to like, all right, we feel something's coming on to like, okay, we're going to act totally normal. Um, and I would not be surprised if we don't have any sort of weird cold weather come in in March, we will have an early spawn at Smith. It's interesting because off camera guys, we were talking about last year when you came in second place at a BFL. And I think that was April 10th. Mm -hmm. I think that was the one. Maybe oh, late. might've been a week later even. Okay. And you said you caught a couple of spawning right then. So that's you're talking two to three weeks difference that's insane yeah so it, go, going back to the water temperature thing real quick so i do think if we don't get any cold weather we are definitely going to have an early spawn um i can already see smallmouth moving up like they're not as deep as they normally would be um or like kind of their winter winter stuff they're definitely starting to move up um but i really start to look at like 56 i feel like i can really narrow down which area this is a smallmouth they're going to think about doing it um and then in, to me i've i have found smallmouth spawning at 57 58 um they spawn deeper on smith so that's a, a a big thing like we obviously fish for smallies in minnesota a ton is they're going to spawn more on main lake stuff they're going to spawn on steeper stuff and they're going to spawn deeper and i'm talking six to ten foot beds um, they like dock posts, um, you know, so it's, it's very different than the largemouth stuff as far as, um, their beds go. But on the plus side, you don't really have to see them when you're bed fishing. If you get within five feet of a smallmouth bed and they're on their bed, they're going to eat whatever you're throwing at it. It could be a hot dog. Um, they don't really. Kevin Van Dam, I think it was, oh shit. It was a 2008. I think he won at Smith Mountain Lake and he had smallmouth in his bag that really played hard. Sure. And generally, I think smallmouth would play very well in a multi-day event. How how much do smallmouth play in a single day when it's just, you know, just yeah. swing to the fence? You're not going to win, but you, I caught a, almost four and a half pound smallmouth today. Holy shit. Yeah. So um, I've had, I had a four pound smallmouth on the guide trip on Monday. Um, and anytime I can do that, that tells me that there's something to that. Like if I can help someone else catch a caliber fish like that. That's then nice I know, <laughs> yeah. Then I know I can go out and let be locked in, head down on live scope and snipe them myself. Um, I don't think you're going to be able to catch 22 pounds of smallmouth. I could be wrong because it is going to be sunny, which is a huge plus for smallies, and it is going to be crazy gusty on Saturday. So, it, me personally, I'm going to target. I'm definitely going to target smallmouth. I mean, if I have four to four and a half pound class fish, it doesn't matter. I'm going to target them anyways, but. I'm going to target them because they're easier to catch um, on a multi-day event. Fantastic. They're just eaters, dude. They're just aggressive. They're mean. They're eating heavy right now. Like their guts are nasty full um, and they're not that hard to, to really get to bite. I mean, throw a swim bait out there I, as a, as a, Somebody who's going to fish from the pro side, I know what I'm going to do and I'm going to straight up ninja them and use live scope and, and probably be kind of annoying to my co-angler. So whoever I draw, I'm sorry. Uh, but at the same time, I feel like I'll be able to have my co-angler catch a limit just bombing around a 2.8. Like just bomb it around, cast out, 
and see what happens. There's there's plenty if they're swimming around. So why why is that your strategy? I guess in more of a big picture tactical sense, are, are you fishing points this year for BFLs? Are you just jackpotting? Like what is your vibe with that? Yeah, so I'm here to take your money. <laughs> <laughs> um I don't have the schedule for points. I think I will in the next couple of years, probably I'll probably do five um just for points because i feel like i can i can do it i am gonna just try to jackpot the smith mountain ones just because i have the freedom of of the business that i made and you know this was kind of my master plan was i wanted to be able to do tournaments where i had five days off and give myself a competitive advantage so that that is part of it um but from my practice this round i'm just not seeing five big bites so for me, I think it's going to be, you know, and I, I practice real hard, dude. I burned a lot of gas and I'll probably do a post of my trails because it's all over the map. But um, I played a little smart in the fact that we're going to get almost two inches of rain tomorrow. So I didn't even go to the rivers because I know they're already kind of stained up and getting two inches of rain. A lot of those upper creeks on both the rivers are going to be pretty socked in with mud. There'll probably be a good stain line, you know, halfway down the rivers, but I checked multiple times and I never put anything together for me. Um, and me being a Minnesota guy, dude, I mean, I, I would rather, I would rather go crack 17 pounds of smallies on six pound line, eight pound line on a spinning rod, and then go swing for the fences after, if I know the bite's going to be from experience, I feel like the bite's going to be a little bit tough after the pressure. I see. I see where your mind's at. That makes a lot of sense now when you think about it. And guys, that's why you got to ask that because I do believe there's two types of ways you can fish tournaments. You can be the guy that says, like, I swing for the fence all the time. And that's the guy that only catches one. He's like, well, I caught 30 pounds in practice on a jig. And you have the other guy that's like, you know, I might not win this, but I'm going to play for points. I'm just, I'm close to the green. I'm just going to try to, you know, chip it in and then putt it a couple of times. Yep. Because uh, a lot of times you can win tournaments like that. The one tournament my brother and I almost won in college, it was a regional in Ohio. And we didn't think we had a chance because we weren't local. So we just took a nice, like conservative pattern and it ended up winning because a cold front came through. So it is important, I think, to have multiple strategies laid out. And what's one that's just, it's, it might not win it, but you know you're going to have a solid performance. Look, I came home from Florida. I fished for two hours, and then I jumped in an open tournament last Sunday because I was like, look, I need to get into, like, the gears turning faster, make adjustments. Like, so I'm going to use this little open, like, pickup tournament as fun. And it was super grindy. People caught 20, there was huge bags on Saturday, huge bags, 24s, 23s, 21s, 21s, 18s down the list um, for the TBF and for an for like a TBF and a ABA. Dude, I won Sunday with 1521. Out of 17 boats, only three dudes brought a limit. Um, and so for me, I try to, I'm always trying to look ahead and take my fishing notes and my experience and my gut and say, all right, look the front's coming in Thursday, Friday, they're going to chew Thursday, Friday, you have a 100 guys coming here and setting the hook on every bite they get Thursday and Friday, because they don't get to fish that often. And fine, rightfully so they totally should. Plus, they got to see what type of fish they're around. So the lake gets beat up for three days, the bite is good. And then Friday night into Saturday, we get massive pressure rot uptick, blowing 30 mile plus hour winds and bright sun. I just don't think the fish are going to want to chew as much as everybody's probably hoping with the wind. I think it's just automatically going to be tougher, um, which I take, you know, I take that stuff really to heart really quickly because I believe, you know, we, we used the word before you and me started chatting of the whole adjustment piece is if I run two, three good spots Saturday morning and I can't get a bite on a big swim bait or a jerk bait or something that's like a big, bigger fish bait, I'm picking up a spinning rod by seven o'clock. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not messing around on Sunday to have it be 11 o'clock and I have one five pounder and then I can't get any of my three and a half to four pound fish to eat because I decided to chuck around a big bait. So my first my my inkling for saturday will be in like 30 minute chunks is how i'll probably break down the day so then let's say in an alternate universe it's a three-day event and it goes thursday friday saturday so saturday is going to be the shittiest day are, are you thinking just bank weight and then just 
just just guts and nuts it on a Saturday type of deal? Is would that be kind of the strategy? Yeah, yeah. If it was, let's say this tournament was Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I would have chucked big baits all day today. Figured out if they were doing that or not. Tomorrow, I would have done like a half and half. Um, you know, and from practice, I mean, I can scramble together 15 to 17 pounds right now. Um, and so I feel like today, if I would have, like today, I took most of my hooks off and then I didn't set the hook really. Um, although that smallmouth that I caught today, I literally, I could not reel fast enough to get away from it. <laughs> that's, how, that's how stupid psycho they are. It's like, oh, like I turned the trolling motor and I didn't realize he was there and I turned back and he's right behind my bait and I reeled in as fast as I could and he absolutely sm like I could not get it past him. Um, so that'll also tell you something for the bite. Um, but you know, a, a multi-day event is, is completely different in, in my opinion. If it's a big fish body of water you, in the spring, you're going to have weather change every three days. You're going to have a pressure drop or a pressure rise every three days. So you just have to utilize knowing that fish bite better in a prefrontal condition or when it's right on the front, as opposed to high skies, wind, um, and everything with that. So I, again, with the BFL and Smith Mountain being an awesome place, there's a chance somebody still cracks 25 to 27 pounds and gets lucky on the right bank early enough, um, or there's a late bite window, but our tournament's 6.30 to 2.30. So yeah, which, which I thought was pretty, which I thought was pretty crazy. Um, I don't know if they'll, I don't know if the second window will even be before 2.30. It's more like a 3.30, 4 o'clock type deal. I don't know why. That's weird. Yeah, I saw it today when I signed my waiver. But yeah, we'll see. But but multi day out here specifically, you should be able to catch a big one every three days. Um, so if people want to come down and get a, get a trip with you, mm -hmm. what are the different bites? Like, okay, uh, if they want to try to do a big swim bait bite, uh, catch one on a bed. Yep. Like, when would they want to book a trip? With yeah, you sure. For those so yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I talk about this a lot when I do my guide trip. So so. One thing that's important for me guiding specifically, this is good because it's like part of my purpose, I feel like for it is when you jump in the boat with me, it's not just a, hey, let's go fishing. I'm a quiet captain, like cast over here. If you catch one cool, I want you to become a better angler from going out with me. I want to talk you through fishing in general, movements in general, bait fish, crawdads, all that. And then I also break down Smith Mountain basically by the month. Um, and that way people can come out when they want to catch it a specific way. So to hit your point, since you're the big swim bait guy and you obviously are itching to get, get down here is that is right at the cusp of starting. Um, for me, it's a water temperature deal. So we're at that 47 to 49 tipping 50. I really love it from like 51 to 54. That seems when it's, uh, that seems like the whole, you know, they're up way shallower, they're on stumps, they're on docks, they're on shallow rock. It's not, you're bombing out a, a big swim bait over a point and letting it sink for 15 seconds and just reeling over suspended fish. Um, it's more targeted. So that goes to about three quarters of the way through April. Um, and then we get a mix in that of, you get a good shaky head bite in mid-April. Um, that's that zombie, lackadaisical, wacky rig Senko, like slowly drag like a 3 16 shaky head. Can catch giants, but it gets somewhat tedious. Um, and then by late April through most of May, most of my guide trips are going to be bed fishing. So um, if it's something where you want to try to get a big one on a bed, I'm out there three, four days a week. I mean, I know Plenty of spots where there's four to six pound class fish um, that we can that we can mess with and and train on that. That's a big thing. If people struggle with bed fishing, I've had guys specifically hire me because they want to come out and learn how to hit them and how to piss them off, when to leave, when to come back, um, that whole process. And then from post spawn through July, it's Smith Mountain's top water heaven, man. Some days in June, we can go out there even on a bright sunny day, slick calm and throw top water all day and have good numbers, good size, small mouth, large mouth. Um, th th those are really fun trips. That's when I usually get like repeat clients where their kid's like 10 years old and the kid caught 
you know, a three oh, pound, a like a three pound smallmouth on a pop or on a spinning rod. And he lost his mind. Um, so, and then July, August, you know, I get some guys that, that struggle with fishing in the summer, which is understandable if they don't have the time to graph. And they're just kind of trying to understand that a lot of that is finesse fishing. You know, I'm showing, I'm getting guys that are like, Hey, I throw a Carolina rig. And I'm like, well, guess what? We're throwing a drop shot all day. Like you're going to learn how to do this so that you know how to pick it up and when to pick it up. And then I have a guys that are like, Hey, I finesse fish all the time. I want to throw a 13 inch worm. Can you show me how to do it? I'm like, yep, we're going to only going to get three bites, but one of them is going to be a six pounder. So we're going to go throw giant rods, giant line and, and do that route. Um, September can either be good or extremely annoying. Um, and that's really just dependent on, you know, where the bait's at, how small the bait is. That's the time of year where you got to throw like really small swim baits and like get annoyingly stupid with line size and, and shapes and colors and stuff like that. Um, and then basically October through December is fall fishing in a nutshell, chatterbait, spinnerbait, crankbait, still some topwater, jerkbait, fluke. That's kind of a hodgepodge of like, you know, we're junk fishing at Smith, even though there's, there's a million different ways for you to catch it, you're junk fishing. And then December through January, you're doing Domeki spoon, blade bait and fishing, fishing deep and using your electronics. There you guys have it, like, you know, from the guru himself. Um, and, and one thing I'd be remiss if I didn't ask that without the shad kill this year, do you think that's going to help or hurt the big bait bite? Hurt. Yep. I think um, I don't like being around a ton of bait. Um, that might be like, I don't know if you saw that somebody caught a 940. Did you see that? It's uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so he was around bait. And is that guy fishing the tournament because he's screwed? There is no way he's going to do well in this. Uh, I don't think so. Um, I don't I don't know him. I, I obviously like we're all everybody kind of knows everybody at this point down here, but I've never met him. I'm not I'm not sure. But, you know, I don't when when I'm fishing and I see bait balls top to bottom for 100 yards, I don't really like stuff like that. There's too much for them to pick from. The only time that can really work is in the winter. Um, when the, when the predators are below the bass and it's like, okay, you shoot a silver spoon down as fast as you can, right? Not to their heads. Um, so I, I don't think it's going to be good. I think it'll leave a lot of fish offshore further out. Um, and then they just have too much to pick from. I mean, again, why would you eat a jerk bait on a slick, calm day with a little, you know, a little bit of cloud cover? that twitches the wrong way when you look to your left as a fish and there's 7,000 little minnows for you to go vacuum up. Um, so it's, it really does separate the boys from the men, especially now that everyone has access to the, to the forward facing sonar and f whether it's, you know, hummingbird Garmin Lorance, you get out there and Bassmaster tells you if you see bait fish there, but then I think you're, you're right. You hit the nail on the head. It's like, at some point it's like, no, this is not going to work. And you have to leave bait, which is almost like against everything you're taught and anything you read or anyone you listen to. Yeah. Yeah. I prefer, I, I do like being around some, something, um, you know, it's kind of the, the rule of three, like I'm looking for structure, I'm looking for bait, and then I'm finding the fish, um, is I like that those little pods, like when you're looking on live scope or even on side scan or something like that, where it's like all of a sudden you see a pod of bait that's like 10 feet deep by like five feet wide. And then all of a sudden you go another 50 yards and there's two more little pods that are that size. That's where I'm like, okay, there's enough there's enough broken stuff up in here where if I find a bass going in between the two groups of, of bait, I can trick him. Um, as opposed to it's literally top to bottom in bait and why the hell would they bite my stupid, non-natural looking thing? Um, and then, and then this is the time of year too, you know, you're talking about big swim bait stuff and, and getting into that is the gizzard shad are the first shad to really run up shallow. So there'll be times when I, maybe not this early, but maybe in a couple of weeks, like if I go throw a spinner bait on laydowns and my trolling motor like hits a limb, you'll spook gizzard shad out from a brush pile or a laydown or whatever. And they'll literally like flying fish, like you, like just jump out of the water and they'll be 14 inches long and there's eight of them together. 
Um, and that's, that's a good indicator for me. I'm like, okay, it's time to start chucking around a, it's time to start chucking around a big bait. So time's getting there. I got to send you this photo. Halliker, uh, I, I think he's your DW origin as well. He was stocking trout at Clearbook Pond. And it, when he stocked it immediately, a five and a half pound largemouth just swallowed. It was like an eight inch trout. Yeah, uh, full. Yeah. It, it, and people don't really understand like these fish, when it's that time of year, and I'm telling you, all these ponds that get stocked with trout, they know when it's time to stock. Sure. It's the same thing with lizard shad or blueback herring or whatever. When it's the time for them to be chowing on those, they will eat those bigger baits. Yep. Period. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's a mental thing until you get it. And then after you get it, it's hard addic- It's a hard addiction to break. Um, especially in, if you're fun fishing, hell yeah, go for it. Put it in your hand. Like, who cares if you don't catch a fish? Like, go out. Like, I have a guy trip on Monday after all these tournaments. And their literal sole purpose is they want to throw an 8-inch mag draft. Um, and so the weather's setting up fine for it. And yeah, the lake's going to get beat up. But it it's again it's just trending towards it getting better and better and sundays saturday and sunday are both going to be sunny so there's going to be areas of lake that aren't in the wind that are going to get into 51 52 maybe even 53 degrees plus um plus with the stain um the lower if it rains enough the lower end will stain up like there'll be there'll be plenty of stain in the water to start throwing um to start throwing that but the addicting part is like do you throw it in a tournament? So I, I need to this year and, and next year, I need to revamp my strategy for that because I used to be, I don't throw it in practice. I'll only throw it in a tournament because if I hook one, I hooked a, a giant, I don't know. I don't know if it was Smith or it was Kerr and it screwed me over in practice because it was an absolute toad. And then I locked in and I did terrible in the tournament. Yep. And so my brain switched to like, you know what? establish something else and then if it's time just pull it out in the tournament and you'll get that one or two bites yep. like, do you like how do you how do you like to incorporate it into a practice versus a, a, a game time situation so my whole goal this week was to break it was i got a bite on it I, <laughs> was i got a bite on friday i know better because i my biggest bag on smith is from a big swim bait so I know it. I know it's possible to go out there, and I know it's possible on the perfect day to get seven bites and to cull a few times. That has happened once in four years, and I fish a lot. So the likelihood of you coming down as a weekend guy or one or two days of practice and landing on a specific day, not practicing it very much, and it working specifically for you on a tournament is so low. Um, and so for me playing conditions what's happened this week i never got a bite on it um i switched to a smaller swim bait not like a kai tech or anything but like a smaller bigger swim bait um and i did get i did get my shit rock this afternoon um and just didn't set the hook so i have no idea but i'm just gonna assume that that was a that was a better fish but um i have to throw it for a little bit like no matter what, no matter what's going on, if I have four fish for 13 pounds and it's 12 o'clock, I will probably still go spend 30 minutes chucking it around on stuff. Uh, maybe try to hit five spots and see what can happen because at Smith, it could be a, it could be a nine pounder. Um, so that's how I incorporate it. How I hope that this weekend is going to go is that I have six hours to chuck around a big swim bait. Um, and that I'm sitting with 18, 19 pounds pretty early on and that I can just pray that one decided that it wants to eat. I don't know how to word this. Um, it, is the big swim bait thing? Cause you saw like, I don't know if you paid attention to the Clark's Hill thing today and there were some guys with some big ass swim baits on the front. More and more people have big swim baits. Is it just a form of gambling where you're like a Carl Jockinson and you're just going to like, you know what, come hell or high water, I'm either going to cash a check today or i'm going to bomb with it or is there a strategy in which you can use it because i i don't know yet like i get you can catch a kicker with it but the the idea of it going to be all five in your limit damn i don't know it's a that's tough it's a you got to have some big ass balls to chuck it all day long thinking that you're going to get five bites but smith is in all of virginia smith is the lake to do it at is to yeah. say, hey, I'm going to live or die by this thing. Because, dude, honestly, you could even get four bites on it, and you're still going to be 
you're still going to be right at it um, as far as as far as chewing at at who's ever leading. Um, I've had I've had many days with five bites, but it's in that like eighteen to maybe twenty twenty one pound range on primo conditions. Um, where if you rotate in like a jerk bait and a crank bait, you can add another two, three pounds just by having a little bit more variety in your, in your, um, approach. But yeah, it's, it's, I know some guys that do it. Uh, there's a guy down here named Chris that that's like, he smashes them on the swim bait when the swim bait deals on, but it's, it's gotta be a lot of different factors coming together. So I would say if you want to get into it, um, Smith's a good place to learn the bite the rod reel setup that you need, like specific baits. Everyone obviously is is thinking mag draft and chucking mag draft, but there's plenty of other baits to throw um, and variety of, of baits to throw. But, um, you know, one thing that, for example, my, my guide trip on Monday, one thing that a lot of people think on the swim bait thing is that they're going to rip the rod out of your hand. And what a lot of people don't realize is they're coming from behind to eat the swim bait, so it doesn't actually feel like very much. Um, so you need to have a, you need to have a sensitive rod. You need to have the right size rod. Um, line size can definitely be a thing on the swim bait, but it's, it's, it's a super addicting bite. It's not as ferocious as everyone thinks, but when they're eating it, I mean, they're, they're eating it. No, I mean, amen. I can talk about it again. Like I, I'm, I got the bug for it. I'm addicted to it. Um, and it's just interesting cause I got to, uh, interview Mike Buka actually, nice. uh, a couple months ago and really delve into his past. And it's so interesting that more, and this is why I, I got creamed online and I talked to, um, I'm a little over the place, but the chief of fisheries biologist for Virginia. And I, I point black asked me, do you think the Virginia state record will be broken? And he's like, no way in hell. Um, 16 pounds is it's too crazy. But I talked to Mike Buka and the thing is like, everyone's throwing big baits now before it was like three people. And that to me where it's like, statistically, if you have all these kids throwing a mag draft or these big baits, it's going to buckle in the next 20 years. There's no way in hell because yeah. people are fishing the right stuff now yeah. for it to happen. For sure. I think there was a kid back. I don't remember. This was probably in the fall. I think it was one of the Bass Cast events. Same thing. He had like a nine pound something and he was rolling a HUD on the bottom. Like, <laughs> so cool. yeah, just if you spent the time, I think if you did spend the time on Smith and you just said, hey, for the next two months, I'm only going to like, yeah, slow roll swim baits on the bottom, um, you could probably see fish pushing 10 pounds. Um, so, so did you see, I think you, yeah, you were tagged in, someone tagged you, but in this, maybe it was me, like Nolan Miner said he'd give me his kayak if Smith Mountain broke the record. Broke the state record? Yeah, like people were giving Smith some shade about breaking 16 pounds. I was shocked about that. Um, <laughs> 16 I, I could see 16 out of here. I don't know when, but dude, I will tell you when that 940 came out just the other week, I had a few buddies text me being like, this is ridiculous. Like, blah, blah, blah. Dude, I have striper fishermen at the gas station show me pictures of 10 pounders all year long that they're catching on live shad in 50 feet of water. Like, yeah, I see 10 like pounders from them all the time. I don't understand that thought process when, when I had, when I clipped Travis and we're talking about the, the record, everyone was shocked when I said, I, I think it's probably going to be Smith is one of the, my top picks. And people were just like, Oh, that's not true. It's like, but then you have people saying like, well, you know, 10 pounds is crazy. Like, why is it so crazy? Cause you haven't caught one yourself. Therefore it doesn't exist. Yeah. Like I, I, it makes no sense to me. Well, people and don't you're think talking dudes, the, the only, the only fish that get posted are younger dudes that care about social media, want some validation and stuff like that. Uh, you think a 65 year old dude who's lived here his whole life catches a 12 pounder on a crappie jig by accident cares to post it? No, he's going to tell his wife he caught a big one, have a beer and go crappie fishing the next day. Um, and it's the same with the striper guys at the gas station. You know, they'll, they'll we'll, you know, just shoot the shit, talk fishing. And, you know, I'll ask them all the time. I'll, I'll be like, do you guys catch bass? They're like, oh, yeah, look at this one we caught in August. And they'll literally show me a, a picture of a eight pound smallie in August. I mean, just the most morphed, disturbingly looking, fat, dark, smallmouth. And I'm just like, where'd you catch that? And they're like, oh, it was on treetops and 65 feet on an eight inch gizzard. And it's like, okay, what area? And they're like, oh, just down by the dam, down by the dam. Everybody says down by the dam. And it's the same thing with the largemouth, dude. I mean, I've seen literally dozens of photos of 
eight, 10, 12 pound largemouth where the this this old cigarette smoking local striper guys that just slow roll shad and weird depth ranges and it's a largemouth that's with the stripers. Are you you said it was eight pounds ish, that smallmouth? I know a striper guide that had a pet smallmouth last year that was almost seven pounds on his dock. Because if I am not mistaken, the state record is seven. No way. It's got to be bigger than that. Record. Oh, I would definitely say some of these smallmouth I've seen from these dudes are, are easily seven pound smallmouth. New, 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 new River, eight, eight pounds, pounds flat. flat. Eight flat? Eight flat. All right, which fine. Means... We'll say the striper guy caught like a seven. Uh, no, seven no, ten. But my point is, like, that means if it's in the summertime, there is a state record smallmouth in, in Smith Mountain Lake. Lake. Yeah. I mean, yeah. dude, there was a striper guy. There was no joke. There was a striper guy that had a smallie that he would feed sh Shad off of his dock, and he finally caught it one day, and it was always like a 698. 2003. Damn. Yeah, that's insane. So, like, that's the thing, too. It's just like they're there. They're really yeah. there in these places. We just don't know how to catch them. Or they're just crazy, dude. They just I wouldn't be surprised if there are multiple, multiple large, um, large mouth mixed in with the stripers. I mean, if you're an eight, if you're an eight, nine pound large mouth, you're not afraid to go hang with 30 pound stripers. They're not going to do anything to you. And it's all the same. You're fat. You're just as like agile and fast enough to hang with them. So, oh. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think in a couple of years when you have Garmin, you know, update 57 to, to their forward facing sonar, you're going to be able to tell yeah. like, holy crap, that's like a 10 pound large mouth. Yeah. Like that's like, when you the put the contact there. in your eye and it will like <laughs> tell you when to set the hook. Oh God. Yeah. Don't get me. Started. I'm going to get in trouble if I start going on that rant again. I know. Forward -facing oh sonar dude, stuff. my guide trip last Monday, he caught that four pound smallie and it was on live scope and he's a bank fisherman. So obviously it, it it was a fun time for him, but I mean, I, I literally told him to set like when to set the hook and stuff. And we were, we were laughing after, cause he's like, I didn't even feel it bite. And I'm like, you just, it's just part of the, part of the toy, man. It's part of the toy. You know, I, I don't want to keep you all night. I know you got a big tournament this weekend. Um, guys link in the episode description to all the social, uh, is there anything else that you'd like to tell people or anything you have coming up? Um, so I'm going to be out of town again, but I, I would tell you, you know, if, if anybody is listening, that's interested in coming down here, um, I'm getting busier than I have in the past years, which is super, super that's good, awesome. but to try to reach out earlier, um, or sooner rather than later, um, hopefully that breakdown of kind of the months helps people decide when they, when they kind of want to come down, but you know, anybody, I don't know when you're going to drop this, but I would say the lakes back, definitely back to normal. And we'll see how the, we'll see how the BFL goes since you might have the winter. Maybe I'll be back on in a couple. Yeah. Of yeah I was thinking like I could either drop this tomorrow or Saturday on the day of, and then I can have you back in case you win it. Cause that would be, yeah, I don't want to have to double dip the same. Week. There's a, there's a cat on Sunday. How sick would it be if I won three tournaments in seven days? Well, at that, well, at that point, point you better just, we'll take a couple of weeks off. <laughs> <laughs> dude if that happens i don't even know and that's me i'm not trying to sound cocky but that would be so cool that would be so would you, which one would you rather win oh the bfl for sure really yeah i love my cat boys and my, and my local guys but yeah i i would uh i would uh, again i need the fence money bro we didn't talk about the fence but we're getting a fence in the backyard and it's not cheap so if i can if i can take some bfl money and put it towards the fence then uh then that's good. But I don't know, dude, it's, it should be good. People should, uh, should definitely check out the lake. It, it looks like it's back to normal and we're going to have a pretty fun spring here. So. And the last thing, since this is before the BFL, what are the weights? What are you thinking over under? I'm going to go low, which is probably going to bite me in the ass. I'm going to say it takes 2103. So looking at, statistically i think it's gonna take uh i think it's gonna be 19 Ooh. 19 to 20 ish because at least if you look from the past yep i think people are gonna be locked into a big bait or something like that and i, I hope think the front's gonna kill them i hope so yeah so which means you're gonna win <laughs> <laughs> i hope keep chucking them a rigs boys keep chucking them till your arm falls off please yeah I, I say 19 and a half you say 20 ish something right around there but um yeah Billy, again, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Guys, we might be talking a little bit more, but we're done here. Uh, like and subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you next time Fishing the DMV. Bye. Thanks, man. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by 
Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.